Well, thank you for the invitation to uh, the conference today. My name is uh, Dr. Matt Trugenti. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of psychiatry at Yale School of Medicine. Uh, I'm also uh, the deputy director for research at the National VA PTSD Brain Bank. Uh, and I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, work that's ongoing in my lab, um, which is involved in using post-mortem brain tissue from donors with PTSD and major depression. And uh, we're interested in understanding the functional genomic output of what makes uh, a brain have PTSD or, or depression. And we do that by looking at the molecular biology and the molecular systems that are changing in postmortem brain of people who have donated who have PTSD or depression. So the work that I'm going to be showing you today has been ongoing. It's a collaboration between the VA Brain Bank and uh, the work that we're doing here at Yale School of Medicine. So again, thank you again for the invitation to uh, present here uh, today. It's a real honor uh, to give this talk, uh, especially considering some of the previous uh, prestigious investigators who I've noted have given uh, lectures at this particular conference. Um, so this afternoon, I'm going to be talking to you about some of the work that we're doing in my lab, um, specifically looking at the molecular biology and the biological processes that are affected in the postmortem PTSD brain, specifically highlighting the functional genomic findings that we've been uncovering. So first, uh, I have nothing to disclose. I have no biomedical or financial conflicts. And uh, I should note that my views are not necessarily those of the US Department of Veterans Affairs or the government. So although we tend to think of post-traumatic stress disorder as a modern disease, it's actually been around for a long time. However, only recently have healthcare professionals truly begun to understand what it is and how to care for it. And this is partly due to the fact that PTSD manifests itself in, in so many different ways. In fact, the, the current DSM-5 criteria uh, for PTSD lists over 600,000 potential symptom combinations for a PTSD diagnosis. Some people may feel constantly stressed, um, stressed out or on edge. And, and for others, PTSD may manifest as experiencing a sense of detachment or even depression. And still others may suffer from more uh, intense symptoms, such as nightmares, panic attacks, even hallucinations. So the intersection between PTSD and veteran health care is well documented, and this is an area of intense priority uh, within the VA and the Department of Defense uh, to understand this, the, the, bio, the biology of PTSD so that we can begin to develop better treatments for it. In the clinic, PTSD is very difficult to treat. The best current treatments are exposure-based cognitive behavioral therapy, which we believe, at least biologically, is acting through the fear circuitry of the brain. Um, but the only currently FDA-approved treatments are two antidepressants. So they weren't even designed for PTSD. They were designed to treat major depression. So there is a critical need to understand the molecular pathways that are involved in PTSD biology so that we can begin to develop new treatments. So we know a lot about the neurobiology of PTSD. Human neuroimaging studies have revealed dysfunction predominantly in three regions of the brain, specifically the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, and the hippocampus, which we collectively refer to as the fear circuitry uh, of the brain. And we generally think of PTSD as being at least very superficially caused as an aberrant, uh, as aberrant prefrontal cortical top-down control on subcortical regions like the amygdala and the hippocampus. So BOLD and fMRI studies have been somewhat consistent in showing that there is an inhibition in activity in the PFC of patients with PTSD, but there tends to be exaggerated or overactive uh, readings coming from the amygdala. And this suggests that there's a diminished ability to extinguish or suppress potential traumatic memories. The molecular signals of PTSD are only now starting to become elucidated. Um, the first well-powered genome-wide association studies were completed in the last four or five years, and they've revealed a couple of interesting findings. Uh, first, women tend to have a higher heritability for PTSD than men. I should also point out that women are about two times as likely as a man experiencing a similar traumatic event to develop PTSD. 
And to date, most of our molecular studies of PTSD have been focused on the periphery, not on the central nervous system, predominantly in blood and, uh, and saliva. And those molecular studies have revealed dysregulation predominantly in a couple of different biological processes, specifically glucocorticoid signaling, immune pathways, uh, and neuroinflammatory pathway and signaling. There are only now a couple, you know, handful of pilot studies that have come out that have looked specifically at the molecular biology of the PTSD postmortem brain until our study uh, came out last year in Nature Neuroscience, which was the first well-powered transcriptomic study looking at the, uh, at the PTSD postmortem brain. Because as much as PTSD is a disorder of the brain, it's always going to be necessary to look at the brain of people who have PTSD to understand what PTSD is actually doing. So how do we, um, from all of this, you know, this data that we've been collecting, how do we understand the convergent biological impact um, of this? So the approach that we take in my lab is that we reinvoke the central dogma of molecular biology, which is the DNA to transcript to protein. There are a huge number of variants in the human genome, about 3 billion bases. If we were to go one step down from that, so this is the DNA, if we were to go one step down from that, we would reach the transcriptome and look at how transcription, the readout of the DNA uh, is affected. And this reduces the dimensionality from 3 billion base pairs to about 30,000 transcripts. And this is a readily quantitative molecular phenotype in the same way that plaques and tangles are a phenotype of Alzheimer's disease. So we can employ both forward genetic approaches to see how variants affect transcription, and we can also use reverse, we can work backwards and use reverse techniques to look at how specific cases and controls of PTSD brain uh, are affected, uh, specifically the transcriptome. So today I'm going to talk about both approaches and how we can integrate those together to build a better picture of the molecular biology of PTSD. So this talk is gonna focus mostly on a large, well-powered uh, cohort of tissue that has come from the VA, the National Center for PTSD uh, Brain Bank, uh, which includes both PTSD cases, depression cases, and neurotypical controls. We're gonna look at four different prefrontal cortical regions for bulk tissue tr transcriptomics, uh, using uh, traditional RNA sequencing methods where we will literally sequence every uh, molecule of RNA that we isolate from those, from those tissues. I should say that this is a well-described uh, cohort, uh, both genomically uh, and demographically. The, the different cohorts are matched well for both diagnosis, PMI, RIN, and they're matched very well for sex. They are about 50-50 for sex. So we are able to make sex-specific comparisons uh, to look at how males and females are affected by PTSD. So the outline of the talk is here. So we're going to cover these four different regions. Uh, I'm going to start by looking just um, an overview of the transcriptomic changes uh, that we're measuring in the, in the PTSD prefrontal cortex. So the volcano plots that I'm showing you here on the left show the degree of transcriptomic changes that are occurring in each region. And you'll notice that there is um, this is by gene, by exon, and by junction, basically how the individual exons are connected to one another. So you can see where there's the, which uh, genomic feature is, is being regulated here. Uh, interestingly, one of the top uh, gene ontologies for this data set was notable decreases in interneuron markers and enzymes, which I have here in the panel on the right. And it's important to note that it's not one single interneuron cell type uh, marker that seems to be decreased. It seems to be many of them are decreased. And for the most part, the significant ones appear to be mostly in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So I'm going to follow up on that. Many biological processes are disrupted in PTSD brain that we've identified, including protein translation, the stress response, specifically the HPA axis, immune and neuroinflammatory processes, and several neurotransmitter neuromodulatory systems, specifically serotonin, dopamine, glutamate, and as I uh, forementioned, the GABAergic system. So given the wide range of biological processes that are being described, it's not possible that a single cell type is responsible for gene dysreg the, the gene dysregulation that we're observing in the PTSD brain. So we've endeavored to understand how specific 
specific cell types in the human prefrontal cortex contribute to the gene expression differences that we observe in the PTSD postmortem brain and in other stress-related disorders like uh, major depression. So to begin, we know that genes don't act in an independent manner. They form networks. So SST is a marker gene for interneurons, but it is co-expressed with other genes in specific molecular pathways and or cell compartments that we can leverage. And we can leverage um, the statistical correlations between uh, gene co-expression across our individual samples and cluster them into specific modules that we can later look at to gain insight into potential shared function of those genes. And we can pull out specific biological processes, and we can do this in an unbiased way by just simply looking at the RNA sequencing data itself and the level of each transcript. In doing this, we are almost always will identify clusters specific to major CNS cell types, so astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, neurons. And this could give us insights into what's happening in each cell and cell type, um, and this, we believe, is the best first step in understanding the single cell type genomics of PTSD. So these are PTSD-associated co-expression modules that I have in the CIRCOS plot over here on the left. And these all strongly associate with a diagnosis of PTSD, not control, or MDD. And all of them are also significant for cell type-specific markers. The internal yellow uh, rings uh, denote expression of certain markers, which you can kind of follow out using the key that I have down here on the left. The most significant module that correlated with PTSD diagnosis from this data is this module here called CORAL2. CORAL2 contains a large network of co-expressing co genes and 15, diff, uh, 15 significantly differentially expressed genes, many of which are involved in interneuron function, SLC32A1, LHX6, SST, PNOC, GAD2, and alpha one One of the other things you'll notice is that these down-regulated genes all appear to occur in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. These genes, the biology of these genes is well described in both the animal and in the human literature as being involved in interneuron, specifically SST interneuron biology. So we would call this particular co-expression module neuronal, but we're fairly certain that the changes that we're seeing here are happening in a subtype SST interneurons. More on that in a little bit. I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent here because I think this is really important to remember that biological sex plays a critical role in most genomic studies that we do. In our model of gene expression, uh, sex had the greatest effect on gene expression variation. We also found uh, a significant interaction for sex in our transcriptomic profiling. While a significant number of uh, gene expression changes were observed across all regions, so the females are on the top and the males are on the bottom, we found that the overwhelming majority of differentially expressed genes occurred in the females across three regions, the DLPFC, the OFC, and the subgenual prefrontal cortex, while the male's differential gene expression pattern fell predominantly within the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. When we compared the male to female signatures across regions and across comparisons, what we found was that there was very little overlap between the genes that were changing in males and the genes that were changing in females. There was slightly better correlation when each was compared to the combined sex, which you would expect statistically since the combined sex is made up of both. So we can also look at the gene co-expression modules that I mentioned earlier in the different sexes. So in this case, we would perform this type of analysis simply using the females or the males. Here are the two most significant modules associated with PTSD. On the left here are the females, on the right here are for the males. The top female module was enriched for endothelial cell markers, and the top male module was enriched for microglial and endothelial cell markers. So we are, in fact, finding differences even on the gene network uh, level that are specific to each individual sex. And I'm going to highlight some of those differences here. For instance, here, all the female PTSD modules and their cell type enrichments that are significant are here. So here are all of the female co-expression modules, and here are all the cell types on the x-axis, and you can see where they're the most significant. The most significant being uh, pink, the pink module, which is specific for oligodendrocytes, 
and the royal blue module. And this is a completely, I should say that these colors are a completely arbitrary name that's provided by the software to distinguish them from one another. So they don't, they don't, the color doesn't mean anything. It's, it's uh, purely random. So for the microglia, we have royal blue, which is also significant. And here I'm mapping how the top 20 genes within those modules are connected to one another. I wanted to point out, even though this wasn't one of the most significant uh, modules with sex specificity, that there was a module within the females called dark green, and it is significant in the neuronal population. And if we map out what's in that particular module, what we find is that it largely recapitulates the module that we saw in the combined sex comparison that contained many interneuron markers, including ELFIN-1, uh, somatostatin, GAD-1, and PNOC. So we believe that this um, GABAergic interneuron uh, effect that we're seeing in PTSD is driven predominantly by females and not by the males. In males, I'm plotting uh, the top three modules and their cell type enrichment as well. And we find that they're very different than what we saw in the females. The top ones uh, are actually landing in astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, but again, also microglia. And I've mapped the top 20 genes and how they interact with one another here as well. So not only are we detecting differentially expressed genes that are different, and not only have we also identified uh, co-expression networks that are different, we've also started to identify cell type proportion changes in the PTSD brain. And we're detecting those using uh, bulk tissue RNA sequencing. So we use a process called tissue deconvolution, and this is able to detect cell type specific changes from homogenous bulk tissue RNA-seq data. We've detected uh, differences across all of the prefrontal cortical regions that we've looked at. Some notable changes um, include decreases in interneurons, uh, specifically in the MDDs, and in the astrocytes in the DLPFC. These are here and here. What's notable about that is there are previous depression uh, studies that have looked at astrocytes and interneurons, and they, in fact, have also identified uh, differences in these same populations. One of the interesting things about this is that the, P the PTSD cell type proportions do not overlap entirely with the MDD cohort, even though we thought we would see that type of an overlap. So several exceptions um, include oligodendrocyte decreases in the DLPFC and microglial increases in the anterior cingulate, neither of which are seen in the depressed brain. So given the large number of sex and cell type specific genomic changes that we identified in our initial study, we started to think about ways that we could empirically measure those changes in individual neuronal cell types. So because our previous findings were so convincingly showing these sex specific uh, transcriptomic changes, we initiated a project to profile individual cell type molecular profiles from both the cases and the controls. And we started uh, first with the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. I should tell you that uh, this type of sequencing is actually fairly cost prohibitive. So we weren't able to do a complete deep dive and do all four regions at the same time. We're gonna start with the DLPFC because we had no noted many changes in both males and females and this is where we predominantly saw the interneuron and microglial findings that we noted earlier. So using single nuclei RNA sequencing, uh, we generated transcriptomic profiles from 2.2 million nuclei. And this is from 120 donors across three separate cohorts, a PTSD cohort, a depression cohort, and neurotypical controls. And we were able to identify uh, all of the predominant central nervous system cell types, including both excitatory and inhibitory neurons, astrocytes, OPCs, oligodendrocytes, endothelial cells, and microglia. And we were able to compare and contrast the transcriptomes between those two cell types, between those cell types, uh, between our different cohorts. So again, we started in the DLPFC because we observed the greatest number of changes for each nuclei, I want to make sure I note it here, even though we're going to come back to this, for each nuclei, we're actually probing two separate modalities in this study. We're interested in measuring gene expression, as we did in our previous study, and we're using single nuclei RNA sequencing uh, to do that. But we are also in the same isolated nuclei. These are not the same nuclei, but they're from the same nuclei prep. 
We are also measuring changes in the epigenome by performing uh, single nuclei um, ATAC sequencing. So ATAC sequencing will give us a readout of the organization of the chromatin structure of the nuclei. And that allows us to identify both, both open and closed regions of the chromatin. And, and there's two reasons to look at that. The first is that open and closed chromatin may dictate the direction of transcription, whether more transcript or less transcript. And we wanna be able to map whether the gene expression changes that we're seeing are, are occurring because of an upstream um, epigenomic upstream epigenomic mechanism. And there's the potential that there are, there are long range cis regulating uh, events that are occurring. And we believe that there could be uh, genetic variants that are important to PTSD that are harbored within these open or closed, these differential open uh, and closed regions. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a, in a little bit. So this is the transcriptomic taxonomy that we've identified. So this is two point, this represents 2.2 million nuclei. All of the RNA that was isolated from these individual nuclei was sequenced two times. We averaged approximately 50,000 reads per nuclei, and we were able to identify signatures from anywhere between seven and 10,000 uh, transcripts per nuclei, which is very good. Um, and this is giving us unprecedented depth to assess the individual transcriptomic profiles of these cell types. The scope and dimension of the study is on par with the Allen Brain Atlas, uh, and we are currently uh, working with them uh, to identify all of the, the, the prefrontal cortical uh, cell types that may be available. So that's a collaboration that we have. So we've identified that we're, we're gonna show here, you can certainly cluster these more and we're working on ways to identify uh, other markers, but we've identified 39 distinct transcriptomic cell clusters. And again, this is the first formal uh, taxonomic atlas of the frontal cortex uh, currently available. And one of the features um, that makes this particular study unique as say compared to the Allen, uh, the Allen work is that we're interested in looking at non-neuronal cells. So Allen has predominantly focused on the neuronal cells and identifying as many excitatory and inhibitory neurons as possible. We've been very interested in identifying more non-neuronal cells as we realized from our, our original bulk tissue studies that the non-neuronal cells, specifically um, endothelial cells, oligodendrocytes, and microglia are playing a huge role uh, in the molecular pathology of PTSD. So we've been very interested in parsing those cells out and getting more individualized uh, molecular profiles from those. So to give you sort of a glimpse of and the types of gene expression changes that we're seeing in those particular cell types, um, I'm going to give you a, a, a look at two genes that are particularly relevant for, for PTSD. So in total, we've identified about 800 differentially expressed genes, and that's across all the different cell types that we've identified in the PTSD brain. We're also identifying dysregulated genes that have been previously implicated, as I'm showing you here, specifically in glucocorticoid signaling. So the two genes that I've chosen to highlight here, uh, the first is SGK1. SGK1 is a kinase. Um, it's been shown to be involved in glucocorticoid uh, uptake, and it was one of the first genes to be identified using uh, um, a pilot study, uh, which was done actually in my postdoctoral mentor's lab, Ron Duman. Um, it was identified in a, in a small microarray study, and it's interestingly has really held out through even as we've increased in both N and in technology looking gene expression, SGK1 is really hung in there. So SGK1 is a kinase. Um, its exact role, it's been known to be involved with glucocorticoid signaling. Its exact role is not completely understood yet, but we do see changes in SGK1, and these are all reductions in SGK1 in several different inhibitory uh, neuronal populations that I've highlighted here. We also see changes uh, in FKBP5, which is perhaps the hallmark gene of PTSD. Uh, its role, um, it's both a genetic risk gene um, and it's been shown to have important biology in terms of how, um, how fear expression has been regulated. And obviously it plays an important role in glucocorticoid signaling. What was interesting about our findings with FKBP5 is we identified significant increases in FKBP5 in cell types that I don't think we would have expected, in this case, endothelial cells uh, and microglia. So the endothelial cells, what we think may be going on here is that glucocorticoids do require a way to get into the brain. And it's very possible that regulation of glucocorticoid signaling 
like is going to be regulated at the blood brain barrier and thus FKBP5's role in the endothelial cells is actually, um, while we wouldn't have predicted it, when the more we thought about it, it does seem to make sense. We don't have any functional data yet on why that might be happening, but we, this is an area that we're looking to explore. Also, the FKBP5 increases in the microglia are also somewhat of a mystery to us as well. And we're, again, these are some surprising findings. While the gene itself has been implicated in PTSD biology for years, we don't know how to ascribe a functional role to that gene being in these particular cell types. So this type of work is opening it up to a lot of really interesting functional studies, and those are uh, those will be coming out in the future. So now I'm going to switch gears slightly and talk a little bit about our forward genetic approaches to studying PTSD and how they're being integrated with our reverse genetic approaches. So to date, like I said in the beginning in the introduction, there have been several large, well-powered GWAS PTSD, most notably from the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium and from the Million Veterans Program. So heritability for PTSD is anywhere from 40 to 70%. Again, this is another place where there are sex-specific differences with females having a much higher rate of heritability, almost double that of males. Our most recent uh, GWAS using the Million Veteran Program data set identified several high confidence risk loci for PTSD, much more than what had been previously identified in other studies. For our forward genetic approaches, we use these GWAS summary statistics to perform what's known as a transcriptome-wide association study, a TWAS, not to be confused with the GWAS. And we do this to identify uh, risk variants that have an effect on gene expression changes that we're seeing in the postmortem brain. And we do that by, inter by integrating that data with our transcriptomic, postmortem transcriptomic data and expression uh, QTL data from the GTEx portal. So GTEx contains EQTL data. So EQTLs are expression quantitative loci. These are essentially uh, SNPs or regions within the genome, which are known to have a effects on the uh, downstream gene expression of the gene that they're involved in. And they have this data for over 50 different tissue types. And the number of donors in that is, is large. I, it's several hundred. I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head, but it's many hundred donors. So we perform TWAS using the EQTL data from three separate groups within the GTEx portal. And we created these ourselves. Um, we created a combined cortex comparison. So this takes data from all of the known cortical uh, regions, two of which are from our own data set. So that's the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the dorsal anterior cingular, both part of the GTEx cortical data set. So that's one. We also did a TWAS using all of the remaining central nervous system tissues that were in the GTEx data set. And then we used all of the non-central nervous system or CNS tissue for a final comparison here. Unsurprisingly, the majority of our TWAS signal does come from the non-CNS uh, signal. That's to be expected, that's generally what happens with most TWAS uh, experiments that are done. There's just more tissue, there's more data, um, there's better, uh, better annotated EQTLs coming from there. But we were very happy to see that almost a third of our signal came from brain-specific EQTLs. And I'm plotting here the Manhattan plot for the different genes that we identified using those EQTL weights from the, from the cortical TWAS. And um, uh, what I want to specifically point out is that we actually found regulation of this gene alpha 1, which you may remember from earlier in my talk, I indicated was of gene of interest. It's a key driver within our top PTSD associated module, and it's involved in interneuron signalings. So key drivers like alpha 1 are thought to exert control over the transcriptional organization of the given module. Basically, whatever alpha 1 is doing, it's likely that whatever else is going on in this module is doing something similar. So that's why it's a key driver, why it was tagged as a key driver. Oops, that's why it was tagged as a key driver. It's an SST interneuron specific gene and it's involved in synaptic transmission and the prosynaptic density. So basically what this gives us is a link between genetic risk for PTSD and known illness state transcriptional changes for alpha one. 
In the middle, I'm actually plotting the female specific module, the, the female module that was most significantly associated with PTSD. And one of the genes, one of the key drivers in this particular network, UBA7, actually came out not in our cortex specific TWAS, but it came out in our all CNS tissue TWAS. So UBA7, a lot less is known about this gene. It's, in, it's a uh, ubiquitinase, so it's involved in protein degradation. We know it's highly, in, it's what's known is it's involved in the immune, immune pathways, but the fact that it's down regulation in two other cortical regions and does come up uh, in the CNS TWAS suggests that it also plays a critical role in PT PTSD pathophysiology. Another gene that we have identified that, again, we're not sure exactly what it's doing in PTSD, but all of the signs indicate that it's, uh, it's, it's critical for that pathophysiology. So our single cell type genomics work also intersects with our genetics work. As I explained previously, we're generating single cell epigenomic profiles in addition uh, to our gene expression pro profiles. So these allow us to characterize the regional chromatin accessibility within the, nucle within the nuclei of our, uh, of our donors. And again, we can also ascribe cell type specificity to these. Now, one of the things you're going to notice is that these cell types are much less specific than the cell types that I showed you for the RNA sequencing. Unfortunately, ATAC sequencing is not at the same level as RNA, at least in terms of technology and technique, and we aren't able to identify quite so many cell types as we did. We are identifying about 20. I'm only showing you the, uh, the broad names, the, the more super cluster names. But one of the things I'd point out is we are able to identify multiple GABAergic and multiple glutamatergic cell types. So at least we can begin to break down the inhibitory and excitatory neurons. And as you can see from the heat map that I'm showing you here, the ATAC clustering is really good with the majority of the markers for each one of these particular cell types being very unique and specific to that particular cell type. And even cell types that are similar to one another, for instance, these glutamatergic neuron subtypes, while they do appear to have a high degree of expression across many of the same genes, Ultimately, they're different enough from one another that they would be able to distinguish and cluster differently. So even though ATAC-seq isn't quite getting us there in terms of you know, 50 or 40 or 50 uh, individual cell types, we are, still able to get, we are still able to get the major CNS cell types and we're able to get specific uh, neuronal, specific excitatory and interneuronal, uh, interneuron uh, specific cell types within those. So we've begun integrating our single cell ATAC data with the genetics risk data that we're collecting uh, in the large scale GWASs from PTS, uh, for PTSD from Million Veteran Program and from the PGC. So to further our understanding of how PTSD risk signals work, we performed um, cell type specific linkage disequilibrium score regression, that's just called LDSC for the genetics geneticists in the audience. On our, on our S and ATAC C clusters. And then we integrated that with the GWAS uh, sub, um, excuse me, statistics for PTSD. And I should note that, and I'm not showing it here, we did do this for PTSD and for other traits. We did this for hyperarousal, we did this for re-experiencing, and we did this for depression as well. I'm not showing it here for, for the sake of time. But what we were unsurprised to find was that the overwhelming um, we saw that most of the significant enrichment of PTSD risk SNPs were found within excitatory and inhibitory neurons, then followed more closely by uh, oligodendrocytes and um, oligodendrocyte precursor cells. So that's probably not surprising. Um, I think that the overwhelming, the majority of the cells that we have are neuronal, so it's very likely that we could be capturing it that way. But I think this is kind of what we might have expected to see, what we might have expected to see happen. Finally, I'm going to discuss some work that we're looking at on how PTSD molecular pathology overlaps and diverges with other neuropsychiatric disorders, for instance, like major depression. So as I mentioned in the beginning of my talk, we have matched non-PTSD psychiatric control group that we were using, and this is a group that just has major depression. And we've included in this study due to the high degree of comorbidity between it and PTSD, almost 50% of new PTSD cases are also comorbid for some form of depression. So we hope that its inclusion would help us to disentangle the molecular pathologies of both disorders, but also give us some insight into what was PTSD specific. So to our surprise, we found that there wasn't a whole lot of overlap between the DEGs and our PTSD, 
versus our MDT groups. And there was only modest overlap in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So we decided to formally test um, the transcriptomic correlation. Quite literally, we bootstrapped the log two fold change between our PTSD DEGs and the MDD uh, DEGs, and we found that there was almost no there was no significant correlation in the control. Uh, excuse me, in the combined sex, the uh, male comparison, and in the female comparison. So there was no overlap. So no correlation between those groups, PTSD and MDD. We also to, to so we weren't sure about why you know about this finding obviously because there's so much such a high degree of comorbidity between the two disorders. So we went ahead and got an outside data set to make the same comparison. And the outside data set that we have came from the Psych and Code Consortium, from the labs of Mike Gandel and Dan Geshwin, and it included a large uh, meta-analyzed MDD transcriptomic profile. Um, this profile was, was pulled together from uh, many different MDD transcriptomic studies, predominantly within the same dorsal lateral frontal cortex area that we're looking at, although it did include a few other uh, uh, frontal cortical regions. We still felt that it overlapped, the majority of this tissue in the, in the, in the cohort overlapped with ours, which was a, BA, a combination of BA9 and, and, and 46. So um, when we compared our PTSD to that depression meta-analysis, we also found that there was no correlation between PTSD and MDD in the combined sex, the male and the female. One of the things I will point out, though, is that the, excuse me, the female and the male, one of the things that we did, I do want to point out, is there was a higher degree of correlation between uh, the meta-analyzed and our PTSD than there was with our own PTSD group. And it does seem like it's driven predominantly by the males in, in those two groups, uh, which seems to account for the majority of the correlation that we're seeing here. And, and this could be, there's a couple of reasons this could be. It could be because the males in, in our PTSD group, maybe more of them have depression than what was listed, they were pretty evenly matched for depression phenotypes. So we're not sure if that's what the case is, or it's possible that PTSD is just more like depression for males than it is for females. Those are complete guesses at this point. We're still trying to tease apart what's going on here. Um, but it's interesting that even with a separate MDD uh, uh, data set, we were not able to find significant correlation. Now that's not to say that there aren't converging molecular mechanisms between MDD and PTSD. So we performed what's called consensus dissimilarity measures on our co-expression modules so that we could formally test how the DEGs, what DEGs were common between MDD and PTSD. So the genes of a given consensus module are in the same color. So you can see that the PTSD matches the colors down below on the MDD. And we were able to identify a stable set of genes that was consistent across all comparisons, the combined sex, the females, and the males. And it, it contained a couple of really interesting genes, including GAD45B. And GAD45B has been implicated in depression. Uh, animal studies of, of depression have identified GAD45B as being upstream of growth factor signaling, specifically BDNF and FGF, which are known uh, antidepressant targets. And YBX3 is a transcription factor that has, you know, which we believe may be interacting with at least part of this panel to drive those particular transcriptomic changes. So as I mentioned earlier, there is an increasing interest in molecular convergence of psychiatric disorders. And this first stemmed from the initial genetics studies that showed that there was a high degree of pleiotropy uh, or, or risk gene overlap between psychiatric disorders, um, specifically schizophrenia and autism and bipolar, which have a great deal of pleiotropy with one another. This same study that this is one of the Psych and Code capstone uh, papers from 2018. This is also the same data set that we uh, retrieved our major depression uh, comparison cohort. What they did here was they compared the transcriptomic correlation of all of these individual disorders to one another to see if there was also a molecular pathology overlap in addition to the genetic pleiotropy. And they were able to identify uh, many significant correlations between disorders that, that, that have this high pleiotropy, schizophrenia and bipolar, autism and schizophrenia, autism and bipolar, and so on. Um, so we decided that it would be interesting if we would use this particular data and pipeline to identify any of the transcriptomic convergence, any of these disorders converge with PTSD, since PTSD was not in the initial paper. 
And what was interesting about this particular study is that we found that PTSD most highly correlated with schizophrenia, followed by autism and then bipolar disorder. MDD was close, as I showed you, this is the same comparison that we made in the previous figure, but it still wasn't significant. And like I said, at first we were pretty, we were somewhat surprised by this. Um, we really weren't we really weren't sure why there would be so much transcriptomic correlation with schizophrenia and bipolar. But we went back and looked at some of the earlier um, GWASs that it were done uh, for schizophrenia, bipolar, depression, PTSD. And some of those initial studies actually found something very interesting. They found the same thing, that there was actually a high degree of correlation of polygenic risk between PTSD and schizophrenia and with bipolar and much less or non-significant with depression. So it seems as though we were following sort of the same trend as was being seen in the genetic studies. Um, we're in the process of performing transcriptome-wide association studies on public data sets for schizophrenia and bipolar. And we've identified that our old friend, ELFIN-1, the gene, the interneuron gene that I identified uh, previously, is also a significant target in schizophrenia, and it's a nominally significant target for bipolar disorder. So we think that ELFIN-1 may, uh, may be playing a converging molecular role in PTSD, schizophrenia, uh, and bipolar disorder. So I'm going to wrap up and, and summarize here. Um, so genetic risk uh, for PTSD is lower in males than it is for females. Uh, and male molecular pathology seems to be focused predominantly in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, whereas in females, there appears to be a lot of gene expression changes across many regions. The cell type specificity of our, of our work seems to land predominantly on interneurons, uh, microglia, and endothelial cells. Um, microglial inhibition and endothelial cell dysfunction um, were both seen to be impacted, both in the FKBP5, in the endothelial cells, uh, and the microglial cell types appear to come up quite a bit too, especially, again, also for FKBP5 and, and others as well. We've noted, and, and this is an important, uh, I think an important point, that uh, major depression overlaps significantly in terms of the types of cells that are being, uh, that are disrupted interneuron dysfunction has been reported in depression, microglial, uh, not inhibition, but mostly activation. And this appears to be a point of difference between MDD and PTSD. A recent neuroimaging study from Yale looking at the marker for microglia TSPO actually found that in, in depressed patients, there was a high activation uh, of that particular gene, that particular protein, in microglia, but there was a suppression of that gene uh, in PTSD. So while MDD has been consistently marked by MDD uh, activation, it appears that at least centrally in the central nervous system, that PTSD is predominantly immunosuppressive uh, in the brain. Um, and as I said, endothelial cell dysfunction has been noted in both MDD and PTSD, uh, where there's decreases in angiogenesis have been uh, have been shown. There's mirroring of that effect in uh, in the endothelial cells. It mirrors what happens in the neurons as well, where there appears to be uh, synaptic loss. I also want to note that interneuron dysfunction and microglial inhibition have also been implicated in schizophrenia and bipolar. And as I noted earlier, we think ELFIN-1 may be playing a role, at least initially in this, in, at least in part, in this interneuron dysfunction that we've uh, that we've detected. So as you can see, a complex cell type specific genomic pattern is beginning to emerge. And we believe that future efforts are, should be aimed, and we're directing those efforts to be aimed at eliciting the role of specific cell types in, G, in PTSD uh, gene regulation. So this is the significance of, uh, of the talk. PTSD results in massive transcriptomic differences in the human brain. It affects signaling across many biological processes, as I've noted, glucocorticoids, GABA transmission, and HPA axis. We are beginning to create a cell type specific atlas of the human frontal cortex, and that's allowed us to identify specific cell types that are responsible for PTSD pathology. For the ones that are starting to kind of float to the top seem to be interneurons, endothelial cells, and microglia, as I've noted. And PTSD genetic risk variation um, also appears to be cell type specific, with most loci uh, being harbored in excitatory and inhibitory neurons. And as I, um, as I wrapped up with, PTSD molecular pathology seems to resemble schizophrenia and bipolar, 
more than it does depression. And this is an area of ongoing research um, about what might be going on there. I think for now, we're probably a little underpowered in making those comparisons. But the uh, future iterations of Psych and Code, I know, are, are, are very busy with doing cross-disorder comparisons uh, that we are actually participating with in our, with our PTSD data sets. And it'll be interesting to see uh, how, this, how this holds. So I would like to thank my collaborators. Um, I'd like to thank Jing Zhang uh, and Mario Scarica. Jing is an assistant professor at the University of California, Irvine. And Mario is a research scientist in my lab. They've driven a lot of the single cell research that I, uh, single cell work that we're doing. Uh, I'd also like to thank Ion Wang and Jai Wei Wang, um, who are both graduate students. I'd like to thank John Crystal. Um, he's my chair. He's been uh, an exceptional mentor. He's put many different things, in my, you know, resources at my disposal to do this work. He's very excited about it. He's very supportive. Uh, he also stepped, uh, stepped in as my mentor after my postdoctoral mentor, Rob Duman, uh, who has also spoke at this conference in the past, passed away uh, in 2020. And, and I, a personal thanks to, to Ron. I mean, he left an incredible legacy in the field of PTSD. Um, the work that you're seeing here that we're doing and the, the, what the knowledge that we're gaining about PTSD wouldn't have been possible uh, without that initial spark from him. And um, we're, we're forever going to be grateful for, for what he started. And, and I hope that we do him proud. 